Hi everyone, a big welcome back to the G2Z online event series. Thank you for joining us. In the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. My name's Nell Thompson and I'm the coordinator of the National Getting to Zero, or as we call it, the G2Z program, and I'll be hosting the webinar for you today. Getting to Zero was developed by the Animal Welfare League of Queensland, and they continue to support it to this day. G2Z offers its consulting, support and educational services at no charge to local governments and not-for-profits across Australia. Our focus continues to be on companion animal welfare and management issues such as strategy, legislation, operations, programs and community engagement, working towards reducing intake to pounds and shelters and keeping pets in their homes. We invite people to take a look at our website at g2z.org.au, sign up for our regular e-news, connect with us via social media and to get in contact with us to see if we can help or to have a chat about the issues that you're facing in your community or with your organisation. And so to today's session, once I hand over to our presenter, there'll be around 50 minutes of presentation and around 10 minutes of question time. But as you all know by now, it's all a bit fluid. Um, and we will leave the questions until the presentation has concluded. The recording of this webinar will be accessible via our website to everyone to watch at any time. We're going to ask that everyone mutes themselves during the presentation, unless our presenter indicates otherwise. And if you have any questions, you can start putting them in the Q&A section and we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. If you've got really quick questions that relate to your understanding of the content, put your hand up. There's a button down the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to those questions during the presentation. As always, please excuse any working from home background noises that may filter through. I just had um, WrestleMania 3 here in my office. Um, there's a hailstorm outside, so my dogs are inside with me in the office. So. My apologies in advance for dinosaur noises. It's my great honour to reintroduce Amy Sadler to you all today for the last in this set of three presentations. Amy is the founder and CEO of Dogs Playing for Life or DPFL. And with 35 years of experience working with multiple species in varying venues, Amy's become an internationally recognised trainer and speaker, specialising in shelter programs that enhance quality of life and reduce canine euthanasia in animal shelters. The cornerstone of DPFL's programming is the every dog every day, an out of kennel enrichment model that is in increasing demand and has been introduced to over 300 shelters across the US and Canada. I encourage all of you to jump onto DPFL's social media. Um, the Facebook page every day has some fantastic video of dogs in shelters getting out, playing, learning to be dogs, and then you know updates on them being adopted out into new homes. So if you need a smile, get onto the page every day. DPFL's measured programming is contributing to safer shelter environments by reducing dog to human bites while increasing canine life-saving life at an average rate of 4% at participating shelters. But starting in 2017, dogs most at risk of behavioural euthanasia got a second chance at DPFL's Canine Centre in Florida, an advanced training and behaviour care centre with an overall save rate of 86%. Amy's the proud recipient of the Henry Berg Leadership Award and the Maddie's Hero Award and has been inducted into the Members Hall of Fame for the IACP. Amy's warned me that this is a really difficult presentation to get through in just one hour. So rather than skip over important info, I'm just going to let you know that if you need to go on the hour, then feel free. We understand your time pressures, but we are going to get into it right now. So over to you, Amy. Now, thank you so much. And yeah, normally this is at least a two hour presentation. So again, no, no offense taken at all if you have a hard stop in an hour, but um, I'm gonna try really hard to get to the meat of it um, in time, but uh, doubtful because it definitely, um, this is the big one that everyone really wants to dig into because we're dealing with, you know, when we're dealing with breaking up dog fights and all that kind of stuff and you're handling stuff. So 
Um, that's what we're going to be focusing on this time. And if you guys notice, usually I would wait and see who has hands up since we're virtual. I love this picture because it really embodies what I love about the playgroup handling that we prescribe, which is, you know, let the dogs have a good time together. We're really just there as hall monitors if they need us to be, if they cannot manage all the communication themselves. So I love that the Handlers are standing there with their hands in their pockets and smiling and just watching the dogs playing, which is great. There's a problem though, is that the gal in the blue sweatshirt, she has a slip lead around her neck with it dangling down. And I just wanna let you guys know that's a huge safety hazard. So um, usually when I've got a room full of people, I ask them to point out what's wrong with this picture. So that could be very dangerous if the dog just happened to grab that and start playing tug. Um, so, First of all, everybody wants to know, well, would I qualify as being a lead handler for playgroups? And for us, really, what's the most important thing is you have to really love it. You cannot make people do playgroups. I mean, that's how it can go very poorly if someone feels like they're assigned to doing it and their just heart is not in it. And I can say that I've been had the privilege of learning some from some world class trainers and um, that were terrible with dog to dog stuff. It really kind of is its own thing. And it doesn't matter how established you've been as a trainer. If you've not done this before, it's still going to there's still going to be a learning curve. Um, so what we're really looking for is somebody who's confident about the whole concept of it and that they're really comfortable with being in the yard with many dogs together, very flexible, open-minded and spontaneous, because this is not, you know, unlike our typical training sessions, you know, you can have a vision of how you want your play group to go, but there are a number of things that can make the, everything change on a dime very quickly. It could be energy. It could be just a dog that comes in that's sparky. There's so many things. So you really have to be able to be flexible and see what's unfolding in front of you and respond in a timely manner to what's happening in front of you. You have to be a team player too. I've, there's a couple of people throughout the years that um, when they would be running play groups, nobody wanted to volunteer and sign up because they just had a way about them that would put people off. So we, we tell you, you've got to be good at working with people and being a team player because you can't do play groups by yourself. It's definitely a team, team sport. Strong communication skills with both people and animals, and then also just leadership qualities. Again, um, from our perspective, you're really only there to help the dog slow down or stop when they need to. And so you have to have a certain amount of assertiveness and confidence. Um, and same thing with if you, if you have to give people instructions in a hurried moment, um, they have to be able to respect what you're saying and be willing to follow your lead. And you got to be able to learn from your mistakes. You know, there's no way to do this perfectly. And if you have an incident in your play yard, make sure that you um, get everything organized, uh, get the dogs what they need to make sure that they can recover properly. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. And then make sure you debrief together and be open to was there a mistake? Did I make a mistake? Could something have been done differently? Get some feedback from everyone. Sometimes you're going to realize that it just, it just happens. They're animals. And then sometimes you'll know, yeah, that was completely my bad for whatever the reason might be. What you notice is possibly missing here is that we don't expect anybody to have formal experience. Like they don't have to, you don't have to have worked in a doggy daycare before. And in fact, sometimes it's better if you're a clean slate because a doggy daycare environment is very different, contextually different than running playgroups for shelter dogs. Um, and we don't you know, expect you to be certified in anything. We don't even certify playgroup handlers because we recognize that people will create some of their own style. We wanna give you a platform, all of what I'm gonna share with you today of how to move on with this for yourself, but then you know, stylistically people have their own way about it. Some of the videos I'm gonna skip if I don't think that they're really critical for what I'd like you to take away from today. Um, and if we just pull back before you really dig in deep, these are some really important concepts because it gets sticky when we start getting into larger playgroups and how you will be handling those playgroups and how we're going to teach you to do that. So bottom line is that our primary mission is to focus on quality of life. And what we've understood by doing that is that you end up getting life-saving as a result. And the single greatest way that we're going to increase the welfare of any of these animals is just to get them out of the shelter. So what can we do to expedite them getting out of the shelter in the kennel environment and into a home environment? That's, that's just the most important thing. And then while they're sheltered, what can we do to make that less stressful for them? And so when there is regular participation in play groups, that can also lead to increased placement pathways for your dogs. And we've got lots of... Um, metrics to, sh to share with you that you can look on our uh, on our website and go to our impact report and it will tell you what shelters are reporting to us and where the data comes from. And then this is really critical that the only the dogs who are participating in play groups are actually able to reap the benefits. Therefore, we have to strive to be as inclusive as possible so that we can benefit as many dogs as possible. So when we talk about the every dog everyday model, what that means is making sure every dog is getting quality time outside of their kennel. And when you have large populations, playgroups is the most efficient way to do that. That does not mean that every dog has to go to playgroup every day, 
but let them show you how they feel about it. And then you'll determine if maybe there's another form of activity that would be more beneficial to that individual dog than play groups. We are gonna be prescribing to you how to use aversives properly in the context of um, running play groups. And when you're embracing what we're trying to teach you and the uh, proper use of these tools, you can increase welfare and placement opportunities for a larger number of dogs. Um, timely and proportionate information to the dogs empowers them to actually learn. Sometimes there's discussions around, there's a sensitivity to the use of aversives in training in general. And we're with everybody about moving away from the old compulsion models and training in a much more Lima friendly way. And our play groups do fall under being Lima friendly um, because you have to take into context the welfare of the animal and their entire experience. So in the context of making them, helping them to cope and thrive within shelter environments, that's why we go this route and why we um, do what we need to do so that we can safely run play groups to serve as many dogs as possible and get them through as quickly as possible. So this is for some of you that are um, training in behavior people and you know your four uh, quadrants of learning theory. Um, I, this is kind of like a layman's term slide that's basically getting to um, how we're gonna prescribe that you do use aversives in the context of playgroups. So for example, in this, um, in this pictorial here, you've got the big bar at the bottom, pressure and release, which is kind of holding everything up and balancing everything. And that's because it is the most primary skill that we want you to get really good at when you're running playgroups is to apply pressure and release pressure to be able to reinforce the behavior that you want, increase behaviors that you want and decrease behaviors that you don't want. So the application of pressure technically does qualify as a version of a correction. Right now, oh, and by the way, I've got a couple of things stacked under the reward side and a couple of things stacked under the correction side, but you know, that list could be a lot longer. These are just some common examples. So the application of pressure, whatever kind of pressure that is, whether it's the pressure of a squirt bottle or a shake hand or body language or your tone of voice, anything that is the beginning of an application of correction. The release of pressure is a very poignant way to tell the dogs, yes, that is correct. And that's what I want from you. Okay. It's really critical. And you're going to see us teaching this like crazy throughout this whole presentation. Now, here's something that I want you to consider. Um, when we're teaching you something about the use of squirt bottles and shake cans, which we qualify as aversives in playgroups, what I want you to consider is that it really depends upon what the dog thinks about it. So for example, in this video here of the dog <clears throat> being squirted, do you, do y'all feel like that dog? I mean, that dog actually loves the squirt bottle, thinks it's big fun. I'm sure plenty of you have dogs at home that will play with a hose and you can blast them in the face and they love it. And they think it's the best game. So for some dogs, the use of a squirt bottle actually is not even aversive at all. It should actually be moved over to the reward column. Now, similarly, for some of you that joined us for part one or part two, I showed a really poignant example of a little fearful dog named Swiffer that turned around, was um, afraid, and I had to, very fearful, no defense, had to pick him up and carry him out of his kennel peed and pooped, so scared. But after an hour and a half in his first play group, he was like a different dog. I and mean, he just had a very quick transformation. But in the beginning of that video, I was petting him, but it was terrifying for him when I pet him. So we consider petting to be rewarding, but obviously for some dogs petting, especially it might not forever be aversive to them, but in that moment, they might not be prepared for it and might not be reinforcing or comforting at all to them. It could be terrifying for them. So really the crux of this is that the dog is the one that is always gonna decide what's reinforcing and correct or corrective. And you're going to know because if it's reinforcing whatever it is you're doing, the behavior will increase. You'll get more of it. And if it's punitive or corrective, you should see a decrease in the behavior. So that's basically where we're coming from. So in here's a little example of the use of a shake can. Now, do we want more or less of this behavior? Okay, so if we decide that we want less of this behavior, of this little dog, oh, I've got to turn that on, sorry. Okay. Hey, um, I just rattled the can. Good. Yeah. Good. I told her how to work it. And he hops down. So the whole point is that we wanted less climbing of the fence. Now, we could also tackle that by, if he's at the fence at the bottom and he's pacing back and forth and he's not climbing, we could be marking and rewarding that. But remember context, if he's in a play group with a number of dogs, we're not prescribing that you bring it out treats that are doing your training there because that could actually cause a conflict with some dogs, right? So if this is really a play group activity, that would not be the time and place to be marking rewarding for approximations of not climbing the fence. But from a training perspective, that would be very viable. 
So in that example, that was a, the use of a shake hand as a diversity to say, we want less of that behavior. Now, this is another example with a shake hand, which just cracks me up. So let me have a kid on that because I'm feeling it. Thank you. Are you proud of yourself? Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Adorable, right? <laughs> so the truth of the matter of for that little dog, that shake hand was not aversive to him. But if I picked up the shake hand and rattled it toward him, as we had just done with the other dog, I'm sure it would affect him differently. But it was just adorable that he picked up the shake hand and ran around with it, so proud of himself. So training cars and canoes, what do they have to do with one, one another? This is one of my very good friends and one of my first mentors, Waleed Meluth. And he is, uh, was a ring sport competitor. And I met him at a Bart Ballone seminar way, so long ago. Um, at any rate, I was not particularly interested in those sports, but I was always interested in seeing very advanced training because as I was building training and behavior programs for shelter dogs, I just didn't want dogs falling through the cracks. So I wanted to learn as much as I possibly could and bring in techniques and tricks of the trade from all different kinds of training, even if it wasn't something I was interested in. So Waleed had the best analogy that I've ever heard that working dogs like driving a car, you need gas brakes and steering, but the amount of each depends upon car mo model, road conditions, et cetera, et cetera. And playgroups, I think, are definitely just like learning how to drive a car. I mean, many of us drive cars, but we're all, some of us are much better drivers than others. And the only way you get to be a good driver of a car is to practice. You can't keep watching videos or reading books about it. You just got to get out there and drive the car. And everybody starts out by hitting the brakes too hard or oversteering, and you have to get a feel for it as you go. And we say it's the exact same thing about running playgroups. So gas is like the dog's enthusiasm and drive, whatever they're doing. The brakes to me is their impulse control or their stimulus control, two different things to be honest with you, but being able to um, think even when they're really, really wound up and responsiveness, even when they're distracted, like steering is like a different level. I'm gonna get into this in more detail. So here's a really good example. And, and back to my, my quote at the bottom about training with all four quadrants, right? Or embracing this concept of being able to use pressure and release work. It's like steering a canoe and being able to have the paddle on both sides. And what I mean by that is if, if you have been in a canoe and you're trying to go in a straight line, but you're only allowed to have your paddle on one side, you can do it, but it'll take a lot longer. And the nose of your canoe is going to be doing a little bit of this and this as you're like, you know, trying to manage your paddling. But if you get into that rhythm, rhythm and have the paddle going from side to side, it's like a straight shot. Um, so that's kind of our analogy with that. Here's an example of, um, we were at a shelter and they were uh, focusing on positive reinforcement and relationship-based training, which is all great stuff. We love all of it. We just don't stop there. And so this is a dog that had been really struggling. And I'm sure many of you have seen dogs like this in your shelters. And he had very limited handlers because he was difficult to handle. And so we went to observe what they were doing, and then we immediately stepped in and said, okay, wait a minute. So um, here's an example of all four quadrants. So she's trying to offer him something, you know, to, um, redirect that Thank you. 
So do that again, but this time take the leash off. So you have your spray bottle now, which is an effective tool for him. So yeah. he should always have a spray bottle. Um, and when you go in, wait till he has four feet on the floor. So you don't want to go in until he has two feet on the floor. So the thing for that about that video is that the question is, is it inhumane to use a squirt bottle? And they were afraid that it really was. So they weren't providing him with that information. They were trying to tell him, you can do this, you can do this, and redirect him to things that they wanted him to do or options. But to him, that wasn't reinforcing to him. It was frustrating to him. So all that was happening is this was three months that they'd been at it with him like this. So um, we just added the squirt bottle. It was very simple. He responded to it beautifully right away. Um, it was also nice that he was able to take treats because I'm sure many of you experienced dogs are this aroused. A lot of times they won't even take food. They don't want food. They just want to get out. So it was really nice. It was, we had the way to say, yes, we want more of this and no, we want less of that. And it was very clean and it was quick and it was very easy for him to put together. So what we, our question is, is it inhumane not to use the squirt bottle? And we believe yes. Okay. And then here's just a quick video of let you listen to it for a second, and then I'll tell you what it's about. This is EPFL's first annual team skill building week. Okay, so this is a Longmont Humane Society. They had their playgroups had been shut down for a little bit because they had a um, some something, and I think URI had they'd had a big URI breakout or something like that. So most of these dogs have not been able to go to playgroups yet. But what I want you to notice with the handlers is that there are no active corrections on the dogs, but there is a lot of gentle pressure, pressure and release work with their leash to say, I want less of that, or you need to make an adjustment. And when the dog is correct, the leash goes soft. Lots of clicking, you heard that. And most of these dogs are behavior dogs. And at least two thirds of the dogs here are being handled by people that they've never been handled before. By with They've never been handled by the person before because these were our team members that, that, uh, that came in and to, for our skill building week. And many of the dogs had not been in a group class or in this setting either. So the only reason I'm showing you this, and I had a little bit of this in our other ones, is that getting to dogs being able to respond and kind of train up nicely and quickly is by incorporating pressure and release work as well, in addition to satiating them with playgroups and so on and so forth. And lots of treats can get you a pretty nice picture pretty quickly. And you'll see a lot of the people are handling very similarly because they're all DPFL people. Um, so steering. So when we talk about steering, that means that you want to momentarily interrupt them. You want to, you're not really, that's not, it's more that the behavior is inappropriate than it's actually concerning. So you, they're kind of being a nuisance. So let's give you a couple of examples here. So I was using the squirt bottle there and I also was stepping in. So I'm marking with my voice and now here I come to do something about it. And interestingly, what's nice is that with the squirt bottle, you can actually reach them from some distance. So you don't have to get right up on top of the dogs before you start asking them. So we really, when we're there, we're doing seminars with people. We, uh, we talk about say it and spray it. You see it as our last bullet point here. That means always proceed with your voice because we're looking to establish verbal control from a distance. And then the tools and then the use of our body language on top of that will back up what we're asking for. And eventually you can just ask the dogs for things and they're gonna do it. You don't need to use the squirt bottle anymore. Um, uh, with regards to sound and touch accentuating one another. So you just saw me use some pressure and release with the squirt bottle and then body language on, and then all the pressure came off when the dog stopped mounting. So here's another, uh, same version, but with a different tool. And as you can see there, you know, I was rattling the can gently, trying to kind of be directional with it, making sure that I'm paying attention to where I'm standing in, like, which way do I actually want him to go, right? So if I just come behind him and shake that can, I'm just driving him right on top of for more. So I wanted to get to his front and turn him from his head. And he was kind of like, yeah, 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 I'm busy. It didn't mean enough to him. So I turned up the volume a little bit. He told me what you're doing is not effective for me because it's not, it's not decreasing my behavior. So he's telling me how much he needs for me. And so then I ended up making contact with it. So once I had that same rattle, but made contact, I didn't have to necessarily escalate that just the two of them accentuated one another. He's like, okay, now I can hear you. 
And remember, it's only important for us to go in and do any of this if, um, if the dogs are not responding to one another, but if they can have all this communication amongst themselves, that's golden. That's what we're actually looking for. When we want to apply brakes, that means that we need the behavior to stop. So in the picture here, this, which looks pretty serious, the, and it's really funny, but the white dog, believe it or not, looks like it's a male, but it's a female. She's got like a little floppy tummy that's <laughs> flopping over the side, but she was just kind of hawking the, the brown brindle female, annoying her, just not giving her any peace. And so the brown female had to turn up her volume because volume, she kept asking the white dog to, can you back up, back up? I don't know if she had to go to the bathroom. I can't remember exactly what the circumstances, but kept asking her back up. And the white dog was not responding to her. So she turned up the volume and she yelled at her in a much bigger way. There was no fight. She just yelled at her. So the correction, the goal of a correction is to immediately and more urgently interrupt the behavior. It's got to stop, uh, cannot escalate. And the dog has got to show an increased level of responsiveness to either the other dogs or to the handlers. I think food is a little overwhelmed by that. What do you guys think? Yeah. Again, for the sake of time, she just discusses a little bit more that that one dog was playing well, but looks like he's now getting tired. But I was just wanted you to see her style and her technique with it, with what she was asking for. So she did want them to stop. They were starting to get into an argument. But again, if you notice, she didn't panic. She was like, ah! she wasn't, she was just really definitive, very, you know, calm, cool, and collected about saying, okay, enough, you guys go to something else. So in this video, let me pause this for a second. I want you guys to remember this. Uh, oh no, I forgot. From the first part one, if you were in it, you saw this black and white dog. There was a, a video of me talking about why we don't micromanage the dog. And you saw her playing with other dogs beautifully. Well, this was her very first social session and she came from the ASPCA. And um, the brindle girl here, Randy, is our helper dog. I can't remember, Nikki. Nikki was the black and white one. And she is muzzled in this one. And um, I'll just let you watch it and I'll talk about it more. It's hard not to stop that one, but <laughs> or diamond. Yeah, this is the furthest I've seen Randy go. Yeah, I've never seen it from that far. Randy doesn't like it. Okay, so Randy in that video, by the way, we let Randy off the hook because she clearly did not like Nikki. But I want you guys to think, I mean, we don't have time to replay it. But in the beginning, that first correction was very exaggerated because Randy's like, I'm not comfortable with you. And then Nikki didn't know how to take that correction so well. But you, but over time, then you saw another dog mount Randy and Randy didn't care so much. So it's not about being mounted that bothered Randy. It's that she was not comfortable with Nikki. And then after that, they moved kind of off to that other side. And then Nikki was kind of starting to be spastic and trying to play bow and kind of make friends with her. But Randy's like, I don't like you. And so Randy's volume, she turned her volume down. She kind of yelled at her big in the beginning. And then when she's like, okay, well, you're weird and you're trying, but okay. And then she was not yelling at her so loudly. She turned down the volume because she could. So anyway, we let Randy off the hook and then we brought in another bouncy, trouncy male and her muzzle came off. And then she turns out to be a very social dog and ends up being one of our helper dogs. But that was her first time having access to dogs. And actually Dr. Pamela Reed was in that video. One of those sets of feet was her, were hers. And she brought the dogs down for us to evaluate. Um, this was from... Oh, I can't remember the name of the, the um, hurricane, but at any rate, there were a couple of dogs that they'd had long-term in their temporary housing and nobody had claimed the dogs, but they were afraid that a few of them were not placement candidates. So they brought them to us and then we worked with them in our program. And so Nikki did end up being placed and she did great, but she came to us because she was um, extremely unleash reactive with redirection um, on the handlers, uh, very frustrated. And, uh, and she turned out to be very playful. So I'm sure she just wanted access to dogs. And we see that happen over and over again. So what does deference mean? 
when we want more responsiveness from the dogs, we want deference. And it's very clear to see it. Ears will go back and you will get eye contact. They'll do it for each other and then they'll do it for you. So if you're trying to ask a dog to slow down or stop, the pressure should stay on until you get ears back and eye contact. And by the way, distracting the dogs from doing something, if they're going to make a mistake and you are seeing that, it's not that it's not prudent sometimes to go in and basically just um, interrupt and move them away so that they don't follow through and make a mistake. Certainly there are times that that's prudent, but don't believe that you've necessarily taught them anything. They haven't learned anything. Whereas when we let Nikki go through that interaction with um, Randy and Randy gives her information about her behavior, then you saw Nikki start to adjust her behavior. So she's actually learning by receiving those corrections rather than just avoiding her, avoiding altogether and taking her out of the situation. I can't remember what video this is. Let's see. Oh, this is a good one. Now, before you guys watch this one, this is at a seminar at Austin Animal Center. And these volunteers, it was their first time they'd been through all the trainings in the classroom, like you guys have been watching. And then we went out and demonstrated and worked the whole population of dogs first so everybody can see us demonstrate what we're talking about. So we get through startup where the dogs are usually a little bit more difficult because they're pretty wound up and oftentimes when we get to shelters. And so then once we've been through the population and we've learned about the dogs, and then we start bringing handlers in to start practicing themselves. So they're a little herky jerky. They haven't driven this car for very long. Um, and there's a couple of things that, that we'll point out at the end when you watch this. And make sure you go to those monster shake hands. Uh, shake hands. Yeah. There you go. Well, well, Hilda, it's a bad habit at the fence, right? Yeah. Cody, what was your deal with um? Yeah, yeah, I think that they're just gonna they're just building frustration, right? It's normal. You'll see that a lot. That's why we'll give them information about the barrier activity, settle them down, let them in. If you know they're social. What I love about that video is that they looked pretty serious with all that barrier activity, but we'd worked through it before. And what Cody said, she's very steerable. There's a bad habit at the fence. So, you know, you've heard us talk about in the previous presentations that on leash and barrier assessments, they are not indicators of a dog's ability or inability to be social with other dogs. If you want to know if they're social or not, you'll have to let them have access. And then we go through, as we're going to do in this presentation, doing it as safely as possible. So the thing that I didn't like it, before they picked up those shake hands is that they were standing at that fence line in between with the dog, rah, 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 which is very dangerous. This is why we use these tools, especially in the context of shelter play groups. We don't want your body parts within range of these dogs that are really frustrating, frustrated and trying to learn their skills and get back to being a happy, healthy dog. So uh, we want you to be able to use these tools so that you can start to influence them from a distance and not have yourself in the middle of stuff like that. And the monster shake hand is fantastic. The, those milk jugs, because they're soft and pliable, you can hold them. Your hand is actually shielded. So if you went to use it and a dog redirected, you're probably just going to bite the, the monster shake hand. You're going to use it to protect yourself even if you needed to. So uh, you can lob it in the air and just, if they're really going out of the fence line, just lob it in there and let it drop down between them and it'll startle them into a stopping. So uh, I love them. So these are the tools that we hold in hand and the application of them. There's no limitation in tools. I mean, just be creative. You can use anything that you think will, um, will interrupt the dogs without it being painful. Like we don't, we don't want the dogs to be hurt, right? We just want them to be um, interrupted effectively. So typically everything, all of our tools could apply, you could use in the context of breaks because it depends if the dog is super sensitive, a squirt bottle might be um, a very heavy correction for them. Like this poor little dog. <laughs> I think my nice. Oh, she just wanted him to be quiet, but I don't know if she he just didn't see it coming. He got startled, but that that was a big correction for him to get that squirt. Right? For most dogs, it's not that much. So the shake hands, using them for steering, they can also be for breaks if you're using them a little bit more intensely. But here's just a little bit of steering. Wait, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. Get to where we actually use it. Okay. There you go. A more gentle use for steering. Did you guys see how light Amy was with that 
Although before you watch the shake hand with that barrier activity and having them try to apply it with a little bit more oomph and it was less steering and more stop doing that. The air horn, pet corrector by the way is the air blast. It comes like in a little red bottle. We call it pet corrector here. Um, and it's just compressed air. So it goes, psh, makes a noise. If you turn it upside down, it actually blows. It can actually have a visual um, stream of air that comes out, which actually can be nice for some dogs too. It's a pretty intense, most dogs really react in a big way to it. So I consider it more just for breaks. I don't typically steer dogs with pet corrector. It's absolutely, it's stop doing what you're doing. It is the tool that I've found that dogs could redirect on you the most. I think it's just a very startling no noise to them. So I tend to not be close when I use it for the first time. And the air horn, which is like at your um, soccer games, football games, um, you know, the blah, the big air horn, they use them on boats and everything. That is like the scatter them, like the usually the final frontier. And typically, I would only say uh, that that should be used as breaks because many dogs can, can be very frightened if you have to use it. So I use it very sparingly. But here's an example where I was able to use it uh, as a steering tool using it much more lightly. And in other words, email Amy when she's in trouble. There you go. So that she knows. Yeah. So she. And did you see all the ears back and the eye contact when they came boop, 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 and like that, these guys had just really been getting ramped up and I had used it before in a bigger, like a normal way. Like they were, these were dogs that were in very, very, very frustrating situations. They all came out so wound up tightly. And I do want you to remember for later, there's this chocolate dog. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the chocolate dog that's um, got the other one pinned right now. And then the black one with the droopy tail, remember them for later. They played beautifully, but they were just really wound up. So they need a little bit of steering. Now I can't, I hope my picture's not in front of you guys, but over here on the far right, multiple dogs, audible from multiple, audible from multiple, audible from multiple. So if there's a number of dogs that are starting to get fractious or they're having too loud of a conversation, you feel like you need to settle them down. I typically will usually always go to something that's audible and I'll skip my squirt bottle because the squirt bottle is much better better to speak to one individual dog that you want to steer while the rest so that the others don't feel impacted because they will all typically react to the noise a little bit. So the potential side effects of tools, it is true. There is a downside that we prescribe using these tools for safety and so that more dogs can get more out of play group. They can learn from you and, and you can do this safely, but um, these are all the things that could possibly go wrong. Generally speaking is that the dogs, they get overcorrected, not in the way that you intended and they just take it to heart and they were too afraid or they made the wrong association as is the case with any correction that sometimes is misapplied that the dog just didn't understand what you wanted them to understand and now they're just frightened or worried or something. And so if we see that happening in our play yards, just like it'll happen to you in your regular life with your dogs, maybe you step on their foot by accident or anyway, you hurt their feelings by accident, you try to help them recover and let them know that's not what I meant. So we'll definitely focus on that if a dog has, um, a negative experience in the play yards, especially if it's around the tools. There's some dogs that we know are very noise sensitive. So we set them up the play yards so that we really feel like we're not gonna have to use any of the audible tools because the dog has had an experience prior that shows us that they can't cope with that very well. So we're sensitive to all of that. And I'm worried about like the, la the air horn being too close to their ears. Um, I think that's it for this one. Working the gate is one of the most critical skills uh, for you to learn as a playgroup handler. And I know that when I've gone back to do retrainings for shelters, I can tell you that oftentimes what I tell people, I didn't teach it to you that way, and I want you to do it the way I taught you, is that they start to become insecure about managing the gate, and they start trying to draw all the dogs away from the gate and letting their runners send the dogs into them. I think that's a big mistake, because you feeling confident that you can handle that gate and that space and create the flow that you want to have and have the dogs respect that space, the practice that you get from establishing yourself in that way with the dogs helps you build your confidence and helps the dogs to have confidence in you. And it helps them to understand that they need to see what it is that you want from them. And this is not just a free for all. Okay. Um, so embracing the whole concept of taking space, like I'm here and I want you all to back out. And what are you going to do to make sure that that happens? Now, I love the way the handler. Watch how the handler manages with the tools in her hand. Hold on, I'm going to say something before this gets going. Sometimes this happens. She's got tools in her hand. She's got a gate to open. She has a dog on the outside on leash. It's a little bit about tentative about coming in. And then she's got dogs that are eager to greet. So she's trying to manage all those things at one time. And she does a great job positioning herself and then using her legs 
to block block access for the dogs that she doesn't want to come through at that space and then creating the space and showing an opening to the dog that she does want to come in. Nice. Now, I think she did a really good job at that. But the one thing that's missing is she could have, and in that this was an old video, and we do actively ask the dogs with a squirt bottle and with our tools to really clear that space for us more. Now, at that time, I was more comfortable with people being close. But again, why have your body parts in the way if you don't need to? Sometimes it's going to come up. Sometimes dogs are going to try to blow past you, but sometimes we're asking for more space at the gate now. You want to balance between taking a moment to observe the dogs when you're making a decision about whether or not they can come in, but recognize that you might be building frustration, like in this video. You can see that the other dogs are not worried about him. So he's just excited. I love how this, uh, the blue and white girl, she tells him, you gotta mind your manners when you come in here. You gotta do your front door and your back door greeting and then you can play. <laughs> so she does a great job with that. So I was observing him. I used the squirt bottle. I asked him enough. I want you to be quiet. Don't be yelling and screaming. Use your inside voice before you come into play. Uh, and then found a good opening. I was worried that I was gonna build his frustration. So there was that opening and then let him in. And which way are you gonna open the gate? Are you gonna open it out or bring it in towards you? My uh, son Cody has a great analogy. He's like, consider the play, the play yards and the dogs like water, right? And they're gonna go, the more water, if you've got more dogs in one yard, that's more water. So if where is, depending upon how you open your gate, which way are you asking the dogs to flow basically? In this one, I don't have a catch pen. So if the dogs in with me, get past me, they're running around in the fairgrounds. There's a couple of roads around. So if you notice, I, I opened the gate in towards me because in that situation, again, this was older, older days when we didn't ask the dogs to leave the space so much. Now I actually really back them off a lot more. If I had opened the gate out, it would have invited all the dogs that were in the yard with me to push past and to go that way, right? So it was important that I knew to open the gate in. And the goal is always to reinforce the correct energy before they come in. And if a dog, you've already seen that in that last video, if a dog is really very reactive, that is not, I'm not gonna make a final determination about that dog. Um, I'm just maybe gonna make sure that I'm set up properly for them to come in if I don't know anything about them yet. So to strengthen your own technique, verbal control, that's really, really, really what we're going for. Less is more. I don't want you out there jabbering with the dogs all the time. You don't need to be telling the dogs what a great job they're doing. They actually get all that feedback from one another. I really, again, want you to think of yourself as just the hall monitor. You're there more for steering and brakes. They get positively reinforced by the, from each other and through the activity. Um, so I do want you to use a negative marker, which I want you to predict for the dogs that you're gonna mark it by saying we enough, off, out, one of those things, and you're gonna say something consistently. And then now here I come to do something about it. So eventually one day, if you say enough, and you squirt enough squirt enough squirt one day you're going to say enough and the dog will stop what they're doing and you don't need to squirt boom you've established a cue right we if you saw like even with lexi in that video when she was in the snow with the dogs even though they really started to get into a little bit of an argument she didn't she wasn't loud she was kind of low and calm cool and assertive with her voice and not frantic and panicky sounding and you always want to back up your voice with your tools and then with your body language so say it then spray it then move in People have a very bad habit when they first start running playgroups is they get right up on top of the dogs. They come rushing in and hover over them before they say anything. And then they start using their tools right there where you could have started all that way, way, way back in the distance. And you may have actually accomplished getting the dogs to slow down and go to something else without even getting on top of them. Mm -hmm.
I don't appreciate it. Okay, I'll, I was telling, maybe I'll skip this video. So the reason I felt that it was important, I'm sure that you all get this. I don't know why the kids came, that was kids camp. They came to hang out by that tree. They weren't really there to observe play groups. So that's why I was like, ay, yay, yay. And then if you notice, I didn't start yelling and screaming like, oh my God, get the kids out of here. Because then I would just be jumping in with the dogs on the alert, right? It's okay that the dogs alerted, but I definitely want them to be like, okay, thank you. I heard you. Now I want you to go to something else, steer you to something else. And also the kids weren't doing anything. So I don't want the dogs rehearsing, being barrier active to neutral kids, right? It's a training opportunity. Uh, so the first thing I did was instead of rushing to the problem, I turned back the other way to go get one of my tools, especially with all the dogs barking like that. Um, it helped me to be able to get through to them like, so I didn't have to yell and scream, right? Um, the positioning, don't hover. We talk about um, a lot of times when people first start playgroups, they start like really following the dogs around and they're nervous that they're not gonna get there fast enough. And, and when you get confident, you can get a little bit more distance and think about being a pool lifeguard, right? You're not swimming around in the pool with everybody trying to tell them to remember, be safe. You just sit back, you know, you sit up and you observe and you know when the time is that you've got to get in there to help. Common cool demeanor. Conveys to the dogs that you're capable of leading them. Confidence is subtle and insecurity is exaggerated. So when people are insecure in the beginning, they get panicky with their voice, they rush in too much, they hover. Um, they just don't sit back and observe, and then they don't come in definitively when they need to. And it's just like driving a car again. Remember, the only way you get better at driving a car is by doing it. So over time, when you become confident, you'll be a lot more subtle in your handling, but it's okay that in the beginning, you're going to be herky-jerky and exaggerated. So you read right to the dogs when your voice, your body language, and your use of tools are all aligned. So all Cody is using here is the dog is not in trouble, but he's trying to get her to go out. And I guess she's wise to when you go to take her out of the yard, she, if you start to come near her, she'll just lunge at you. I think it was something like that. I can't, can't even really remember. So he's just demonstrating corralling her and using body pressure because he wants her to go to the other yard. So it's pressure on, good. A little pressure off. Not a girl. Nice. She just had that like neener neener catch me if you can if you, wherever you wanted her to go she wouldn't let you go and I can't remember why did I film that oh I called I wasn't there I called Cody and said Pam Reed wants a video of blah 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 so that's what he came up with so she had a, a demo video right let me see what this one is as soon as he's okay. handled that's going to pique her interest she's very she's very attracted by movement she, she wants to play I'm hoping this other dog will play with her nice and rowdy There you go. So he's asking her, I want you out of the space right now. Don't pair it, do it a little bit, say it, then spray it. Okay. Good oh boy. What a good boy. So he's obviously was feeling a little vulnerable. That's why he put himself under the table, right? So what I like about the video, you're like, why would you watch the video? Well, what I like about that video is that Cody was able, the little dog that went under the table, if Cody had used the wrong body language and just tried to reach under the table to grab that little dog, he would have invited the other dog to probably harass a little dog more. So he had to ask that dog to, hey, I don't want you a part of this. I'm gonna deal with this and I want you out. He then turned his side and bent down. So he was simultaneously conveying to the little dog that, hey, I want you to come into my space. Um, and he accomplished that while at the same time, he was using the correct body language and use of tool and his voice to send the other dog away. So he was communicating to both dogs at the same time the exact opposite thing by the use of his voice, the use of his tools, and then his body language. 
What was that other one? Did I miss one? I we don't have time anyway. So, okay. Setting yourselves up for success. As far as collars, we prefer, um, you know, a lot of the shelters, we love it when shelters have uh, martingale collars for dogs, but it's very dangerous to have the slip over the head martingales for dogs in play groups. It is safer to have a regular flat collar specifically for play groups, and you have to make sure it's fitted correctly, the, the nice two finger fit, uh, so that they're absolutely wearing them as a collar, not wearing it like a necklace, okay? And you have to have be able to unclip the collar for safety, just in case dogs are even playing and grab a collar and alligator roll and you can have a dog that's choking. So it's important that you get a collar off quickly. Dragging leashes are critical. If you have a dog that is very, or maybe nervous or defensive with handling, um, but enjoys the dogs, then you can keep a leash dragging so that you don't have to catch them and hook them up, um, hook them up to their, their collar at this point. So we will always use dragging leashes and keep them on dogs that are fearful about being handled by people. And oftentimes they get over that with time. Um, if I'm in this situation, for me, anytime I know nothing about a dog, I'm absolutely gonna have them dragging a leash until I feel comfortable and know something about them. And if you don't have any kind of a catch pen at all and you're just letting dogs in, we strongly suggest that all dogs come in dragging a line and then the handlers can remove the lines when, they, um, when they're comfortable with the dog's play. Preventative gear, the gentle leader specifically, not all head halters are safe to be worn in playgroup in my opinion. Halties, for example, some have too many extra things hanging down for feet and stuff to get caught in. Gentle leaders though, because they can have a slight suppression effect on some dogs, can sometimes be a really good tool for a dog like a push and pull dog that's being obnoxious and poking at everyone. It's been really useful for us to sometimes just pop a gem leader or there's a, another tool called a Kurgo that works great that just seems to organize them a little bit and they, they come in more smoothly to play groups. Muzzles, we do not want you to be shy about using a muzzle. Listen, you can always take it off. What's the worst thing that happens if you're not sure about a dog and you're not liking what it looks like and you feel they, they might go to their mouth inappropriately and you get that feeling and then you let them in. The worst thing that happen is you were right and they end up grabbing the dog, right? What's the worst thing that happens if you put a muzzle on a dog and they come in and you realize pretty quickly that, oh, they're really playful. They were just very, very reactive. You just pop the muzzle off. The worst thing that happens with a muzzle being on a dog is that sometimes they just, they go nuts with it. We do not, for the context of playgroup acclimation, we do not for playgroup use. So we're just trying to quickly get you in and make sure that you can't hurt anybody. So we don't go through a full acclimation period for the dogs. We just get it on them. We do advise that if you have a more advanced training and behavior program and you think you're gonna do more long-term muzzle work to try to use like behavior modification with play groups, then we suggest that you properly um, activate the dogs to the muzzles. But for these quick introductions, like can I just get you in here and see if we can get you better? Um, some of them will just fuss with it so much that they sometimes will catch their new claw and tear their new claw. That's the worst thing that happens. Um, or your muzzle dog gets jumped. That's if you if you just didn't read it right and one of your helper dogs ends up victimizing a muzzled dog, that's a drag. But that's all these things can happen, but not as much as you would think. Now, what is their motivation for aggression though? If I do believe a dog is going to be defensive and that's why they're gonna go to their mouth, I would really, really rather not muzzle them if I can help it and just maybe just have one helper dog at a time to just try to help them feel comfortable because taking away their primary defense is gonna make the behavior uh, escalate. Right, so here's a great example. We actually got a good example of it. So this is Franklin Animal Shelter. And this dog that's muzzled has reports of busting through windows of its house to go after dogs. So if you heard, she didn't do anything that would make us feel like we should muzzle her, but she had a history. The other thing about this dog is he's very sexually motivated by her and he keeps trying to mount her. He's not listening to her when she's asking for space. She, she was aggressing toward him a little bit, but she was aggressing and retreating, aggressing and retreating. Um, so she just wanted him to stop, you know? She shows us exactly how she feels yeah. about the muzzle. He's on it kicks it away. Um, now watch how she engages him now that she's not muzzled. Sorry for the bad feeling for a second. No, fill me. Mm -hmm. 
So it was clear to me pretty quickly that oh, she's just really defensive. And I know she had that history, but I felt like I wanted to take it off. Um, and she did much better when the muzzle was off, obviously. Um, and then here's an example of a dog that I, that I does not read as defensive in this situation. Like, are you filming me? Okay, it's January 25th. I'm uh, the. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Yeah, I'm trying to keep filming Sarah. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's. Uh, yeah. If you need help, I'll help you. But he's not answering. And. Okay. What a turkey. Ah. So a couple of things about that video, and then we'll, Nelly, you'll tell me, because I got a ways to go. So I'm trying to hustle through this. But the thing about that video that's so important is that you could see very clearly the difference of when that dog started aggressing as compared to the one before. One before was aggressing and retreating, aggressing and retreating. This one was not stopping, even though the helper dog was amazing. He wasn't doing anything to yell back at her. He was like, oh my God, can you please stop? He was just trying to be friendly. And, um, you know, even if, if he had turned around to defend himself and argued back with her, I wouldn't have blamed him, right? So um, he was just, he was incredible. We made sure he had a really nice play session after that. So he wasn't left with her being so inappropriate with him. Um, but that is the difference between defensive and offensive. So when in doubt, muzzle up because you can always take it off. So um, for I'm those- I'm happy of you, for you to continue if you have time. Oh, I'm, I'm, I will not do a hard stop. I'm still going to try to get through this pretty quickly. I think we've got about a half hour, literally, if I'm going to do it as quickly as I can. Does anybody have some questions before we end the official first hour? Do you want me to answer any questions quickly? And then I will finish it for those that can make it through. Yeah, that's a good idea. Even if you want to pop something in the chat or pop your hand up or unmute yourself. If you've got anything urgent. You're going to have to help me because I can't multitask like that. So you'll have to yeah. tell me what questions are. <laughs> Don't ask, ask me to read anything and then try to present too. No, I'm not saying anything okay. about Amy. So yeah, plow on. All right. So at this point, sometimes I have people blinking at me thinking, okay, now I think I'm utterly confused because I don't know when I would actually step in because I feel like they feel like they're hearing me loudly and clearly like don't micromanage them and give them a chance and let them work it out themselves. We do not at all condone letting the dogs fight it out themselves. If they're fighting, they're fighting. That's We're not going to allow that. But you always, as a handler, have our permission to test your steering. So if you've had a dog come in, especially if their energy is really high and you're feeling like, I don't know if this dog, I want to know that I can ask this dog to slow down and they're going to respond to me, just ask them to slow down. Start asking them to move or concede space or slow down so that see what tools are effective for them. So you're like, okay, at least you're listening to me. Cause I know for me, especially with really high energy dogs that I don't know, I feel so much more confident when I'm sure they, okay, they'll listen to me, even though they're wound up like this. You know, if I have a dog that is blowing me off right from the beginning, is just trying to get around me and doesn't want anything to do with me. Or if I feel like as I'm trying to ask you to slow down, you're actually starting to drive harder. Then I definitely want to find out what is it going to take to actually get your attention and to have you concede a little bit. Um, because I don't want them to just go full force on one of the dogs. You know, I want to make sure. So you always have permission to test that. When their play is not mutual, like you saw in um, the and this one, when Lexi was with the dogs in the snow, she started to talk about how the one dog was getting a little overwhelmed. So one is having fun at the expense of the other. So when you start to see that, and one dog is trying to say, give me space, give me space. So, or like Randy and Nikki right? It was not mutual. Nikki was not, Nikki was trying to have fun with Randy. Randy was not having any fun. And that was clear. And what we talked about in that video is like, okay, we're going to back Randy up. And actually we got Randy out of the situation. So let's look at this one. So this one goes on and on and on. And I'm like, oh, it drives me nuts. But the white dog is very sexually motivated by the little blue dog. And she, she's put herself against the building. It's hot. She's like over it. And I mean, like, yeah, the, whomever was filming that, absolutely should have stepped in and steered that white dog off of that little dog. It's not any fun for her. Okay, when the response is disproportionate to the feedback they're getting from the other dog. So sometimes, dog, sometimes dogs just can't take corrections well, right? They just like lose their top, right? So you're probably gonna have to get in there and not let them follow through and say, hey, no, you've got to listen to that dog. That was legit, right? She's being a little, a little nasty. 
Yeah, too much. He's like, oh my God, it's too much. It's just a little too much. So I asked her like, okay, girl. stop. That's beautiful. Something, yeah. Beautiful steering, right? That's great. You weren't listening so much to him. You weren't reading his cues that like, ah, it's a little too much, but really easy to steer. So that was nice. Bring you down the energy. So when they're struggling, like when you bring new dogs in that are high energy, especially when they're young, remember the video where I was worried about building the frustration in that little blue dog. And when I did finally let him in, that kind of mama dog, she's like put her foot on him and said, hey, 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 slow down and do the proper greetings. So sometimes the dogs can't do that themselves. And you as the handler need to say, okay, everybody slow down, get through the greetings, and then you can, re you can relax and play. Because some dogs, it will really build their frustration if an, a dog comes in and just won't hold still and is just zooming around. And then obviously when an actual fight breaks out, um, I would like to get in there and give them information rather than just whisk them away. Um, and sometimes you feel like you have to risk whisk them away. Arlene and Saturn, two big ladies, might be going through a little bit of a status discussion as Klein decides he, he really likes Arlene. But so we got our two kind of so there Sam went up, had a couple dogs starting to get an argument, so he moved up to shake her hand to communicate to everybody. So what I really like for you guys to see about these videos is the dogs started to get argumentative. And again, audible for multiple. So she went to her shake hand, which I thought was great, settled the two over here and then turned her direction because the two in behind her started to still escalate. It was beautiful and that the dogs did not have to be separated from one another. They didn't have to be physically handled or moved away. And so often when you get really good at communicating with those tools and being definitive when you need to, the dogs will steer out of it and then they'll go on to something more appropriate. You know, it's just like kids on a playground. You know, they're having a great time, they're having a good time and then they get tired or you know, one pinches each other or bonks the other one on the head and then they get into a fight, you know, because they were playing nicely, but then they tick each other off. Same thing. So better safe than sorry. So um, remember, our job is to be a neutral hall monitor. So this is a do as we say, not as we do video. All right. Yet another example. No coochie cooing. No coochie cooing with the dogs in play. <laughs> She's totally smiling. That's you know what? hysterical. No, this is why I know that's so cute, right? But what we really don't want you to do is li literally let the dogs focus on this time for each other. I mean, you can, you will, I will give dogs affection in the play yard. It's not like you can't touch them and can't give them affection, but I'll like when a dog by, by themselves comes over to me, of course I can pet them. But I think that you all probably have had the experience and can imagine if you get, especially when the energy is really high, if the handler is really getting in the middle of the dogs, you can actually trigger a conflict between them because they end up resource guarding the attention and the affection from the handlers. So you have to know the time and the place to apply your, uh, your affection. Keep the yard free of toys or treats, anything that might be a potential trigger. Um, that actually might be you. Like if you have a very strong, if you're one of those people that's created these really um, strong bonds with some of the dogs that are in your care, some dogs might not want to be, a, want to allow other dogs to be around you. So you have to be aware of that. Check that the collars are fit properly. We already talked about that. And then we always suggest that you use kitty pools instead of buckets or bowls. For some dogs, bowls are an automatic resource guarding trigger. Um, when you're in really hot weather and you've got multiple dogs trying to jam their head into a bucket of water, they can end up fighting because it's just, you know, they're putting, it's just easier if you've got big pools, they can get their feet in it, they can cool down. So we really prescribe that. Once your leashes, you've got these dragging leashes that you have on the dogs for various reasons, but once you're comfortable with their play, you do want to consider taking the leashes off because they can become a hazard themselves. So can you see there? Oops, sorry. Let me to do that. What's also nice about that is Mike did a great job. He used his head. He didn't go in there and start panicking and moving the dogs around and trying to untangle them. He had just unclipped the leash, you know, keeping a calm head. It was good. 
Uh, we never let the dogs play with equipment. We won't let them grab each other's collars. We won't let them drag each other around by the leash um, because that actually, they're not practicing good bite inhibition. They're actually just starting to tug on one another and that could be dangerous and um, provoke a fight. So we don't let them play with equipment. They can grab each other's body parts and drag each other around by body parts all day long because then they're you working on how to use their mouth correctly and gently and to communicate with each other. Certain equipment, uh, whether you believe in this equipment or not, you know, some places, you know, if you have an advanced behavior program and you're an all tools and techniques kind of program, uh, then you might have some of these tools, but they're not safe in play groups. Um, the only one that we do suggest is the gentle leader, as I've already talked about, and um, muzzles when it's appropriate. It is not if you have a dog fight, it's when you have a dog fight. You cannot do this perfectly so that you never have a dog fight. I mean, I think that we've all even experienced that. When I do seminars, I ask people how many have experienced a dog fight. Most people have experienced a dog fight in one way, shape, or form. And then I usually ask people, uh, was it in play groups? Most people, that's not where it was. Was it in your own home? Yep, a lot of people raise their hands for that. So, but but fights can be traumatizing to people, and um, it can be very scary. And again, that's why running play groups, uh, you just definitely have to accept that this is part of it and that the only way you get good at breaking up a dog fight too is by practicing. So nobody wants to set themselves up to have to practice that. Um, so it's just something that comes with time and experience. So keep your cool and focus on safety. Always go to startling tools first. Always, 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 right? If we can just get them all to scatter and get out of it, that's always the best. <laughs> Again, when Cody went in to do that, it, he was very definitive and he did not lay off until the offending dog gave him deference. And then huh, nobody had to be separated, looked like he was thinking, oh, no, I'm really going to go for this. And then he's like, never mind, I'm not going to go for it. If your startling tools fail though, be quiet and calm. Notice again, I think Cody gave one good, like a, I have my steering negative marker, which is uh-uh. And then my brakes negative marker is fine. Typically when I'm like, that's, that's gotta stop. So he did his version of a brakes marker and then got in there and just followed through with the tools in his body language. It's very, very important. If that did not stop those two dogs, there were quite a few dogs in the yard. So the next thing that people would focus on in that yard is removing the extraneous dogs because it's much better to have a fight with two dogs than with 10, right? If the leashes are attached to the dogs, this is the moment that it was for. So please do not go running up and grabbing dogs by the collars when they're in the middle of a, a heightened situation. Um, use the leashes to keep yourself safe. And if the dog is muzzled, right, then don't feel so shy, especially if they're the one that is assaulting another dog while they're muzzled, just go ahead and get a hold of them because you are protected in that situation. So you can minimize um, how, like, like even the dog, the muzzled white dog that was pursuing that helper dog. To me, we kept, Sarah kept fumbling. I was trying to film and she was dropping the shake can. I mean, that poor dog, that went on and on and on. I'd like to stop that a lot sooner once one dog is really, a muzzled dog is trying to assault another one, just stop them, right? Be prepared for re direction anytime you make physical contact with a dog that is, well, you know that too from if you've had an, an injured animal that's hurt themselves, been hit by a car or something's happened or their foot's gotten caught, you know how dangerous it can be when you, you go in to try to help them, but they they are feel like they're being threatened and they can bite you and bite you badly because they're in defense. So be very prepared. If you make contact, I usually do my test touch where if I go to grab a dog by the hind end, I will literally touch first and see how they respond. Um, we always go for the back end instead of stay away from the pointy parts in the front. But if you go to the back end first to either wheelbarrow the dog or to try to tip them or anything, remember they can swing around with that front end. And do not, this is the hardest, most counterintuitive thing that we tell you. Do not just pull dogs apart if one has a hold of the other or they have a hold of each other. Because that's where we can cause the most injuries. Like those lacerating injuries are typically because people have literally ripped dogs apart. It's not typically as much what the dogs are going to do to one another. Usually if they've really gotten in a fight and got a hold of each other and you handle it the way we prescribe, you'll end up with, you know, punctures sometimes. And then many times not. It's amazing. Uh, what is this video? Oops. Okay. So do you remember 
before when I said to you, remember this brown dog and remember this black dog, they were playing really beautifully, but this was in a shelter where the dogs were very, very stressed and double stacked kennels, not getting out of their kennels sometimes for weeks at a time. So the energy was high. So they're playing, 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 playing. And then like kids in the playground, they got mad. So the black one has a hold of kind of the ear and the scruff of the chocolate dog. It's clear in this video, if I just pulled, if we just pulled them apart, we would have caused a severe injury. So we did everything that we just told you in that last, in that last slide, we immobilized. Uh, the black one is the one that is more offensive. So I have him between my legs. I'm trying to keep him still. I have his collar twisted and I'm starting to push him towards the other dog to um, feed the bite. Did it say it on that slide? Because it's supposed to talk about that. You're supposed to push the dog. This is like an upgraded uh, webinar that I haven't, this is the first time I've done it. So some of the material is kind of not in the right order for me, but you're supposed to be feeding the bite, pushing the dogs together instead of trying to pull them apart. And there was no injury to this dog and because we handled it this way. Because you see right there, if we pulled, and then I'm going towards the chocolate dog, and then BB was just holding the other one to just make sure that she could get him out of the way. And notice how I softened the leash, took my legs away because he was still a little bit wound up. And he's like, what happened? So it, do not pull the dogs apart. Where are we? Grab the hind ends. Okay. Let me see if it says it on the next slide. Oh, here we go. Immobilize the latched on dog and feed the bite, which is what you saw just happening then. And we will twist the collar and start to take air. Sometimes you just have to be patient and it takes some time. Be mindful of defensive mouths and remove your hands if necessary to avoid the injury to yourself. So here's an example. Now, this video, this one's hard to watch. It's, um, this was, it was a lot of things went wrong in this video. So it was actually, ugh, a lot of things went wrong in this video. And it was because all the things went wrong that this poor dog did end up injured. But I do want to tell you, he did end up injured as a result of this, but they were trying to demonstrate for me what they were doing in playgroups and it, it didn't go well. Um, but he did end up coming back to playgroups. He ended up with a laceration on his neck, but the vets let him come back or not, it was deep puncture. He came back to playgroups, he did great and he was adopted a couple of days later. So it turned out okay, but um, this is a dog fight video, but it's watch more of the people and everything that goes wrong. Okay, there's a lot of people in that yard. They had the dogs coming in on leash, which we never prescribe. All of those people in the yard and very few of them, none of them went to get any of the extraneous dogs. And so the injury also would have avoided. They used their startling tools for a second, which was great. The dog separated for a second, which was great, but nobody just grabbed the dogs and, and got them separated. Don't pull. <laughs> See the chocolate one? So the person, if you could see, was literally stringing up the poor dog that was getting, and that's what caused the injury. I tipped him on the side, or on her side. Nice. All right. So that's what you don't want to do. That's like, also the other thing that happened with that one was that they used all the, everybody's like tools, 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 tools. Remember what we said, if your startling tools don't work, then stop, start getting those extraneous dogs out and um, focus on the offending dog and then use anything you can to get between them. So to be honest with you, this could have stopped so much sooner, so much sooner throughout that whole thing. But let's say if they were at this point where you didn't have all the extra people in and they were where me and BB were. So they had the two dogs, they had immobilized them and they were pushing them towards each other instead of all that other stuff and twisting the collar and then be patient. That dog wouldn't have ended up with the injury that he ended up with on his neck. And if you need to, if the dogs will not let go, then that's when you use any object to get between the dogs, a clipboard, a pooper scooper. We have what are called brake sticks. They're like, um, you wedge them in and either depress on the tongue for a gag reflex. But, um, and you only pull them apart once they've let go of one another. The other thing in that video that did do well, Rafi, if I said, Rafi, you got to get in there and help them. And Rafi jumped in and started going through our process, tipped the one dog, the offending dog. And then he also moved his hand out of the way to avoid the, the defending dog from biting him. And then it was, it was pretty quick after that, that it was over. 
whenever possible, do behavioral CPR. What I mean by that is it's our like internal term of continue play recover. So like the little chocolate dog in that previous video where he was playing with his friend and then they got mad at each other and then his friend grabbed onto his, his scruff right here. We immediately brought him in with some playful dogs so he would go right back to playing so he wasn't left with that experience. So the same thing with the dog in this fight, he stayed out for a minute before he went to the, to the medical team for them to look at his wound. We cleared everybody out that was edgy and we let him at least walk around with dogs and have it be calm for him. And then you have to check with your medical departments, but all the vets that we've worked with are like, nope, we're down for this, is that we talk about having 30 minutes of recovery prior to poking and prodding and checking for wounds, especially for punctures. It's very obvious when a dog has a wound that needs to be seen right away, it's gonna be some kind of a gash or a laceration. That's the worst injury that, that, we've, that we've had when a dog has a laceration that needs to be seen by the vet. Um, but if it's not that, even if they, like a lot of times they might get nicked on their ear or they'll bite their tongue, there could be blood, but that doesn't mean that there's, you've got to just identify, they don't need immediate attention, just let them calm down, let that adrenaline come down before you start poking and prodding because they might be defensive with you. And you just have to let them kind of like get over it. This was a scary thing that just happened to them. So give them some space for a minute. Uh, this one. Hey, what's up? Uh, I'll take this. Okay, much better already for, we don't have the hysterics. There was a quick attempt at tools, but the one offending dog came right in. So it was immediately, this is, this is DPFL people that are boom, going in um, to help. And you can see how much better coordinated they end up being. The blue dog is the offending dog. So the camera person gets the extraneous dog out. So in this, in this situation, what had happened, the dog was let in, Cody was coaching someone and the person he was coaching just, Cody knew as soon as that dog came in, that dog was supposed to be muzzled. And she just kind of came in and beelined for the first dog. So um, the only injury that occurred from that fight was the offending dog had a nick on her lip. So no medical treatment needed. So even though that was a very deliberate offensive, came in and grabbed the other dog, uh, the only other thing that I thought maybe a little bit better is the white dog, the handler that was with the white dog, if he had kept that little dog a little bit lower, that would have been a little bit better. But you could see that that was much less frantic, more coordinated, calm, very deliberate going through these steps and minimal injury. Um, okay. That other video is of someone talking about, not in the context of playgroups, they were at their vet's office and they prevent, no, no, no. They prevented a dog from actually dying. Another dog got loose and attacked a dog and they practiced all the things that we talked about. And the vet said that the dog probably would have lost his life had they not managed that the way that they did. So that's what that video is about, but we're out of time. So this is just as far as evaluating risk. And as you can see over, this was seven years, 15 dogs at a time, Monday through Sunday. And this week, these were injuries to the handlers after that period of time when I was at Longmont. So statistically insignificant. Um, this is how we talk about when, if we were there physically with you and doing a seminar, this would be what our next steps would be. Um, this is just opinion stuff. And then finally, um, adjustable and scalable. I think what's really important as a takeaway, so I'm, I'm sure also for you guys being in Australia, because you have the breed bands and everything, it must be fascinating for you to see all of these pit bull type dogs in um, play groups here from the, with the shelters, but everything has to be taken into context. So there's, um, there is nothing wrong with doing smaller play groups. We are not purporting that you have to have 20 dogs at it at a time or else it doesn't count. That's not the truth at all. You want to build your play groups based upon you're trying to create good experiences for the animals and you're trying to learn about the animals and you're trying to help them cope and thrive in a kennel in a kennel environment better that is the purpose of what you're doing there are some dogs that are do not enjoy being in larger play groups but they like being with a few right so there's ways to set up your play the most important thing as a handler is you never want to feel at the mercy of your play yard so you want to you always have the dogs coming into the play yard that is within the comfort level of the handler we cannot I think that was in part two that we talked about it. 
how do you know when a dog enters play group? It has to be the comfort level of the handler that is so critical. And being on the outside, being a uh, armchair quarterback is a bad thing to do because you want the people in that yard to really feel confident and feel like you've got their back. And practice will make perfect. Everybody, the dogs and the people, everybody will get better together as you um, drive this car. Um, strive for inclusion so that we don't want you making a bunch of assumptions about what dogs will or will not benefit from play groups. Let them show you and go through our steps to give them safe opportunities to get out there and show you how they feel about being with dogs. Um, and definitely make sure that the dogs that definitely are not going to benefit from play groups, either it's too stressful or distressing for them, or they really just have shown you they prefer time with people, then make sure that they have that opportunity. Think macro when assessing approach and risk. So what ifs should include what happens to the dogs who are pro prohibited from play group. I mean, the truth of the matter is you never know until you try. And so we want to be safe and you want to, you want to protect the dogs from bad experiences. Of course we do. But if you're overprotecting them and they don't get a chance, what opportunities are they missing? And what are you not learning about the dogs? And are you possibly not giving them a better experience that they could be having through playgroups? You just have to, you have to be weighing that all of that all the time. At full impl implementation, playgroup is a multi, oh, you guys can read it, I'll have to read it to you. Um, it's just the fundamental enrichment for us, for the, like right now we have a contract with Los Angeles Animal Services. They have 20,000 dogs a year that they're servicing. They've got six care centers. The one that we're focusing on now in South LA, they have 350 dogs on the ground at all times. And before we came in, it was a big kind of expose crisis thing. There were dogs in those kennels that weren't getting out for weeks, sometimes months. And that's just not humane. Like, that's not what we're all here for. So for us, Playgroups is like the only way those dogs are going to get out of those kennels is if they start incorporating a playgroup program, which is what we're there to do. Um, so it's our foundational enrichment, assessment, training, and behavior modification all rolled into the activity of playgroups. Oh, wow. Okay. And we actually have served over 330 shelters. Um, and we've got great stats. So it's kind of like the thing to do. Let me see if this is like a fun video. This will be a, like, this is our closing fun video for you. If someone were to come to me and say, um, what's, what's the thing that you bring to you? And I immediately start thinking all these things, but first it's just that we're an inspiration. So we're fully inspired. I'm watching not only our, our staff, but our volunteers work with the dogs. The dogs are a lot less stressed. They get outside more frequently. Um, we're getting dogs out multiple times a day. In the kennel, they're a lot more relaxed. Um, we're doing some more in kennel enrichment as well. We're able to focus more on the dogs that are having a harder time in the kennel. I think that they are going to experience a better quality of life while being here. I think that it will make them um, be more marketable to people who are physically seeing them outside of the shelter. Um, watch the fencing and see them play. <laughs> Uh, so I think it's really going to help our process in helping them adapt to what normal life may be like. The temperament inside the kennels is a lot lower. There's not as much excitement. When dogs are being uh, walked in and out, the kennels are clean. <laughs> um, and I think the dogs are they're tired, so they're not so much upset and barking uncontrollably. Some of the dogs that we thought were not the other dogs turned out to be our former dogs. That's dogs we never had it adopted. Learned so much more about them being in the playgroup. They're getting more exercise, more play, more socialization. It's really exciting to see that when we bring the dogs out to the playgroup, that we're also seeing a lot of the uh, rescue groups engaging and, and taking a look at assessing the pets themselves to see uh, how they're interacting with the other dogs. Uh, the adopters, potential adopters, are seeing the play and actually have adopted them right out of the play because uh, so it's pretty exciting to us. It's just really great to see the interaction of the public, the rescue groups, uh, and the dogs all together.
Wait, watch for it. It's a pig. So that was our 200th um, shelter celebration video from a couple of years ago. Anyway, um, for any of you who have hung out and stayed with me, if you've got questions, so sorry that that I just could not get it in an hour. Sorry, Nell. No, don't be sorry. We are so grateful. You're so generous with your time and you couldn't have possibly cut out any of that because we need to see all of those videos. It, and like I said before, it's just adds to the description. Um, I, I have to tell you too, one thing about breed bands, they don't work and they don't work for lots of reasons, but we have lots of pibbles here, lots of blockheaded dogs. Yeah. So um, yeah, yeah, every shelter has them. So it's it's funny. It breed bands so don't crazy? work in any way. <laughs> yeah, it's just so crazy. But yeah, anyway. But um, I've never seen a pig in a playgroup. So <laughs> I know. You do that have to be very good... careful with that, but it did work out. So that pig had a great time. That pig was having a fantastic time. Um, from my point of view, I mean, I really appreciate you reminding us about the dog deciding what is a correction and what is a reward because we can get really stuck on that, as, oh, yeah. as I'm sure you know. So as a you know, trying to have in my mind always, in the back of my mind, am I enjoying this or is it? you know that the, the dog's enjoying this or finding this a problem or whatever so that's just such a great thing to have in the back of our mind all the time and that pool they our lifeguard analogy I love mm -hmm. that that is mm -hmm. yeah fantastic that is really such a good picture once again to put in our mind we do have a question here um but I'm not sure that it's something that we can um that is actually addressable in a, a play group you know um session but it's how can shelter staff tackle the inappropriate behavior of rescue dogs towards people or children you mean rescue dogs that, that are owned yeah i'm not sure i uh, perhaps it's about shelter dogs um manika please feel free to add more context but i think um i well, mean for me I think, yeah. I think if you're talking about a dog that has some stranger danger, so how can you help them to meet people if they have stranger danger? We have a whole seminar just for that. <laughs> wow. We have a whole, yeah. So stranger danger dogs and dogs that are dealing with wariness of strangers. I mean, that's more of a training seminar. It doesn't, what, what, how play groups does pertain to that is that definitely get those dogs into play groups and see, because that can be your most successful way to introduce them to strangers is if, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times we've got dogs that are nervous about new people, but we'll accept people coming into the play group because they are, um, the other dogs are comfortable with them. So they are comfortable with them too. So that can be one aspect of a way to help a dog build confidence around strangers. Um, but that's successfully teacher, teaching a, a stranger danger dog how to successfully meet people. It's, it's a whole training routine that we do. We have on our website, we have um, under events, we have webinars and we do have a stranger danger webinar that we do. Um, I don't know, I can look it up while you guys are asking other questions and I can see if I can get a date for you, but um, I would go through that first. And then, you know, I think we're gonna be holding a couple next year here in the United States, but mm, love you yeah. to come to one of those, but that, that's a that, whole training thing that is outside of playgroups. Well, and talking, about the website the website has got a bunch of amazing resources and you know the booklet on how to get um 
things started is mm -hmm. sort of a great partner to this set of webinars, I think. So and don't the forget learning it. library. And the learning right. library. We have like over six hours of, of videos that have um, notes on them too. You have to share your email with this, you'll end up on our email list, but you can access that, it's all free. Right, yeah. So don't forget everybody, get over to that website because there's just a ton of really, really good stuff on there that um, is just gonna be really helpful. And, you know, I think Amy talked about it. Playgroups doesn't have to be about 20 dogs. It can be a couple of dogs, you know, just one step at a time, just start doing it though. I think it really is the message, just get it going. And as you get more comfortable, as the volunteers get more comfortable, um, you know, as everybody's skills increase, then you can start to expand it, make them bigger or whatever, it, you know, needs to happen for your particular facility. But but something is definitely better than nothing, um, even if they're only small and even if they're only once or twice a week. It's, you know, it's a, an opportunity that those dogs weren't having before. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think, too, that th the other really good reminder for me was that permission to test your steering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that because sometimes you're not sure um, and yeah, there's no harm if you do it the right way to, to just give it a little try, test those brakes, test that steering, and you've got a much better idea of where you're going um, or where the group might go. And it can really boost your confidence. Um, and then you behave just differently in the group, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it is really for me. And again, I don't do the playgroup seminars anymore so much. I mean, every once in a while I end up doing one, but um, and as I get older, you know, I just, when I was doing it day to day, I was a lot more confident. So when I roll into yeah. it too, I definitely know that as long as I know that the dogs are steerable for me, then I'm not even so worried if they start to get into a little bit of an argument, but I can't stand that feeling of like, I feel at the mercy of the yard. If I ever feel that way, something's got to change. Either yeah. I've got to remove a dog that I've just not, cons that I'm not sure about or whatever it is, but you just never want to be in that position. And that's really each individual handler. And yeah. like my son, my son, Cody, is is uh, like a master. He can run these really large play groups. And for me now, we talk about the lifesaver model, meaning a roll of lifesavers, right? And if you, yeah. you come a point, if you've got to put one in, one's got to come out the other side, right? There's only so many that can fit. So I'll right. get to a point with my yard where I feel with the energy level, this is about good for me. The dogs have had, they've all been out for at least 20 minutes each, 30 minutes. And so I'll start as my handlers are bringing dogs, somebody's going to go out as someone mm. comes in, just not because I want the exact number of dogs, but I want the energy yeah. to remain. Cody is really adept at, he can bring dogs and keep adding them. It's almost like the balloon model. Like he's going to keep blowing <laughs> up that balloon until, okay, it's going to pop if I add another one and it'll <laughs> kind of stay there for a while. But, um, but there's just the bottom line, comfort level of the handler. Yeah. And listening to yourself. And that's, I guess, the key with working with animals, you know, as a whole, listen to your feelings, mm -hmm. listen to your physical responses, all of those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, don't get dramatic about it, but certainly listen to it and respond to it and, you know, make the change what need, you know, that needs to be had. Um, okay, we are really delving into your evening now. So if there are not any more questions, everybody, um, I would like to thank Amy again for just being so incredibly generous and giving all of us Australians this opportunity and for us to be able to record these webinars, use them as staff and volunteer training exercises, you know, get a couple of pizzas and bottle of Coke at the end of the day and put on a, an hour's training session. These can be really, really good resources for the whole team. So thank you, Amy. We really hope to stay in touch with you and really hope to see you and your team out here in Australia at some stage. Um, I hope, you know, we've been invited and uninvited, invited, uninvited. And I think, I think the big, the, it's the use of aversives. Like people, they want us to come and then they think, no, we can't invite them. So it goes back and forth. So someone's going to get brave enough one day to get us out there. We will make it happen. Don't you worry. <laughs> But thank you everybody for all your attendance today. It's actually the last webinar for 2022. So we're ending on a huge high note. Uh, we'll hope you, you will join us again next year. And um, yep, everybody take care. Thanks again, Amy. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Okay, bye.